Hi, everyone. Welcome to a webinar this week. Uh, we'll be having a Jin Jun Liu, a PhD student at SUTD here in Singapore, uh, to give a talk on uh, disentangled representation learning. Jun is actually in Taiwan. We're still doing some COVID quarantine after traveling. Uh, so Jun previously was a research assistant in the Music and Culture Technology Lab at Academia Sinica in Taiwan. Uh, he also received a Master of Science in, Compu in Music Technology at National Chao Tung University in Taiwan. And he's currently working on representation learning of music and audio using deep learning. Uh, June, if you're ready, I'll let you present. If there's any questions, uh, people can write it in the chat and uh, we, can, uh, we can answer them during or after the talk. All right. Okay, thanks for introduction. And so first of all, I want to make sure uh, everyone can see my slice. And, but yeah, I think it's fine, right? Yeah, it looks fine. Okay. So thanks for attending the webinar. And the following will be um, me presenting descent and goal representation learning using Gaussian mature variation autoencoders. And we focus on the applications for synthesis and conversions of uh, musical signals. So um, table of content. So we will be expecting the background and a little bit about variation autoencoders and the extension to Gaussian mixture prior. And also about a little bit about disentangled representations. And also the proposed framework that is applied to both the um, uh, modeling isolated instrument sounds and also expressive singing voices, followed by conclusion and future work. So let's start off the um, presentation with variation autoencoder. So it describes a simple generative process, um, which says that the observed data X is generated by a um, latent variable Z, which is hidden, not observed. So we want, and this is basically a latent variable model, and we want to map the relatively simple latent variable Z, which lies in a low dimensional space to a relatively complicated observed data space, which, which lies in the high dimensional data space. So for the mapping function in the era of deep learning, we want to use the neural network to parameterize the mapping function. So for such a latent variable model, for example, X can be a human faces and Z can be the genes that determine the, um, our facial appearances. However, this causes the computational intractability, specifically in the context of the latent variable models, we are interested in latent uh, uh, representation learnings. Um, more specifically, it is the posterior distribution, P of Z given X. So for the, um, through the Bayesian theorem, um, which is to multiply, which is to express the posterior distribution as multiplication of the likelihood and the prior distribution divided by a normalizing factors. And it is the denominator that causes the intractability because of the high dimensionality of the observed data. And also the fact that we have to integrate over infinitely many possible latent variable Z. And also the fact that we are using the complicated neural network as the mapping function. So we resort to variational inference for learning such a framework. In particular, we introduce a simple distribution Q of Z given X and a simple means that it can be like a Gaussian distribution and to approximate the true posterior distribution P of Z given X. And in terms of the approximation, we are using KL divergence to measure the closeness of the two distribution. And following the definition of the KL divergence and rearranging the terms a little bit, we arrive, as, we arrive at the following formula, which says that um, optimizing the right hand side of the formula, the two terms on the right hand side, effectively optimize the left hand side, which is the, which is the um, log likelihood of the data with respect to 
the data parameter theta and also minimize the KL divergence that we originally want to optimize. So eventually our um, objective function become, becomes the two terms on the right-hand side, which is also called evidence lower bound elbow. So in the context of VAE, um, which is actually can be, uh, which actually can be seen as a regularized autoencoders. So both the approximated posterior distribution Q of Z given X and the likelihood P of X given Z are parameterized by neural networks referred to as encoder and decoder respectively. And on the right hand side, we can see that it is basically from a higher level perspective, uh, autoencoder. So we have a data input X and then we get uh, the, um, through the encoder, we get the bottleneck um, intermediate feature representation Z and then from which we reconstruct the data X. And however, um, in the context of variational autoencoder, what differs from autoencoder is that we have a probabilistic interpretation, meaning that um, we model the posterior distribution as the Gaussian. So the job of the encoder here is actually outputting the parameter of the Gaussian distribution, the mean and the variance from which we sample a latent variable Z. And also the prior distribution P of Z is the standard Gaussian. And this can be extended to other more complicated distribution as, we'll, as we will see later. And then the decoder likelihood function P of X given Z is also a Gaussian distribution. So uh, accordingly, our objective function that we just saw in the previous slide, the reconstruction and the regularization term here, actually uh, becomes a simple um, forms. To be specific, the reconstruction term becomes the mean square error because of this parameterization. And the regularization becomes, um, uh, so there is a closed form solution for the KL divergence be because both of the um, posterior distribution and the prior distribution are Gaussian distribution. So we have a closed form solution for this term. So in sum, the VAE can be, from a higher level perspective, it can be seen as the autoencoder with a regularization. So now we want to extend the standard prior to the Gaussian mixture prior, which is more complicated and more flexible. On the left-hand side, we have the standard Gaussian prior, um, which is um, to map the latent variable Z to the observed data X. And then we have a standard Gaussian here as the prior distribution of the latent variable. On the right-hand side, we have a Gaussian mixture prior, which has one more layer of hierarchy using a categorical variable on top of the latent variable. So the prior distribution of the categorical variable is in practice set to be as a uniform distribution. In this case, the conditional distribution P of Z given Y is actually a Gaussian component. So the marginal P of Z becomes a Gaussian mixture distribution. The main difference, as we can see in the figure, on the left-hand side, we have a unimodal distribution where the standard Gaussian uh, is the prior distribution. Whereas when we use the, uh, the Gaussian mixture as the prior, it is multimodal and we can learn the, the crosses here. The crosses represent the mean parameter of each of the Gaussian components. So um, this comes in handy when we want to achieve some creative application later on as we'll be, um, as we will see later. As for the objective function, uh, for the Vanilla VAE, uh, again, we have the reconstruction term, we have the regularization for the latent var variable, and visually, we have the posterior distribution, Q of Z given X, and then we regularize the distribution to the standard um, Gaussian distribution here. 
for the Gaussian mixture prior, we also have the reconstruction, but now we have a little bit more complicated um, chaotic divergence, which is actually a weighted sum of individual chaotic divergence. So visually, we also have a um, posterior distribution Q of Z given X. And then we want to regularize the distribution of the latent variable to three different components in the latent space. In this case, because we, um, for example, we have three different classes. So three um, Gaussian components in the latent space. So we want to regularize the, la the latent variable um, to each of the Gaussian components with a pushing force Q of Y given X. And such a pushing force can be determined by P of Z given Y the Gaussian likelihood of each component. So it is a measurement of saying how likely the latent variable here belongs to, the, um, belongs to each of the Gaussian com components. So, so the, the, the weighted sum here, um, the pushing force is proportional to the P of Z, it's determined actually by the P of Z given Y. On top of that, we have a regularization term for the categorical variable Q of Y given X. And to regularize the distribution of that to the uniform distri distribution that we set in, in practice. And in addition, we can also consider the supervised case where we've already known the information of the ground truth label. So um, in this case, for example, we have the data X and when we exactly know that the data is labeled as class one. So we can just say, we just want to regularize the posterior distribution to class one. And then we set the weight of the rest of the Gaussian components to be, to be zero. So the, one of the benefit of this algorithm is that we can um, leverage semi we can leverage um, semi supervised learning in this case, saying that um, saying that okay for those data, for those labeled data, we can use the formula for the supervised. Uh, we can use the supervised formula for those labeled data, and then we use the unsupervised formula for those uns uh, for those data without labels. So yeah, so this is the benefit of the, one of the benefit of the algorithm, we can use semi-supervised learning. And then before we go into the framework um, that we use for the applications, um, we talk a little bit about disentangled representations. So for example, we want to learn, in this case, we want to learn a decoder D the mapping function that we mentioned in the very first slide, such that um, the observed data X is rendered by uh, the decoder and then from the two variable F and G. So F and G in this case are face and gender respectively. So if we have a disentangled representations for these two attributes, that means that we can manipulate one of the attributes and without affecting the others. Meaning that, for example, um, we have the face variable as F and then gender variable as male. And then in this case, we decode a sample that has the facial traits of big eyes, flat nose, thin lips, and it's a boy, it's a male. But if we change the gender, to female without, um, without touching the face, like without changing the variable of the face, then the rendered data can, be, uh, can have the same facial attributes, but with the different gender. So in this case, we say that we have a disentangled representation for face and gender. So the follow-up problem could be, how do we learn disentangled representations with the algorithm that we just introduced, the Gaussian mixture variational autoencoder. So now the framework. So the framework here that 
uh, will be later on applied to both of the application. Um, disentangle two significant attributes of the data, Z1 and Z2. So we model the data X as being generated from the two attributes, Z1 and Z2. And as in the Gaussian mixture variation autoencoder, we have Y1 and Y2 to govern um, the class, the category of the latent variable. So this generative process simply says that we first determine the labels Y of the two attributes, and then we sample the latent variables Z1 and Z2 from the conditional probability, a uh, conditional distribution P of Z given Y and P of Z, uh, yeah, P of Z given Y. And then finally, we sample the observed data X from P of X given both the both of the latent variable. And then, um, as we mentioned before, we can consider unsupervised, supervised, or semi-supervised scenarios for the two labels Y1 and Y2. So now we talk about our first application, modeling isolated instrument sounds. So in this case, we want to disentangle pitch and timbre, which are the two significant attributes of the musical instrument sounds, isolated instrument sounds. So the generative process simply says that we determine, we first determine which pitch to play, and then by which instrument do we play with, and then we sample the latent variable pitch and timbre from the picked category. And then the continuous latent variable ZP and ZT here express the variation of pitch in instruments. And in this case, we assume the pitch, uh, the, the pitch labels are always given, whereas the instrument labels are par or only partially given, so it is semi-supervised. For the data set, we use um, close to 2,000 isolated instrument sounds. And then there are 12 orchestra instruments and 82 possible pitches in the data set. We extract only the first 500 milliseconds of each recording. And each input is represented as a 43 by 256 male spectrum. So the audio, the recording of each note is converted to 256 beans male spectrogram. Here is the architecture and the training objective. We um, use the spectrogram as the input and we have the pitch encoder and the temporary encoder to encode the two latent variable respectively. And then from which um, we use a shared decoder uh, which takes in the concatenation of the pitch variable and the timbre variable, and then to um, generate or reconstruct the data here. And because we are using Gaussian mixture prior, uh, Gaussian mixture distribution as the prior, so we also have to learn the mean parameters of the Gaussian components in the latent space. The way we do that is by simply initializing the two matrices one for pitch, the other for instruments. And the size of the embedding is M for pitch, um, which is the possible number of pitches, 82. And for the, the instruments, the possible number of instruments is 12. So L equals to 12. So uh, the two lookup tables, um, are trained all together with the rest of the network. So note, notice that the variance are fixed. The variances for all the Gaussian components in the latent space are fixed as constants because we found that it is um, empirically, it is better if we do so um, in terms of the training stability. And then um, as I mentioned earlier, we considered the, the pitch to be given. So pitch labels are all given, so supervised YP. And then the instrument labels are only partially given, so semi-supervised YT. So we have a reconstruction term here. And then for the pitch, we, um, 
we, we just use the supervised formula that we just mentioned earlier. So you regularize the latent variable of the batch to the corresponding Gaussian components in the latent space, given YP, because we've already known the labels of the input data. For the supervised timber, we also know the we also know the instrument labels of the input data. So we can just regularize the latent variable of the timber um, to the corresponding Gaussian components in the timber space. For the unsupervised data, um, those, those not labeled, th those without instrument labels, we have to use the unsupervised formula to, uh, to, 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 train the, to train the data, to train the model. So we have to marginalize over all possible L classes. And then on top of that, we have a regularization term for the um, pitch variable. And then for the, so here is the visualization of the T-SNE projection for the temper space in specific. That is, we visualize the outputs of the temper encoder Q of ZT given X. On the upper hand, on the, on the first row, um, where we use the standard Gaussian as the prior. And then on the second row, we use the Gaussian mixture prior as, as our prior distribution. For the first row, mm. we, um, the first row refer, the, the first column refers to uh, the unsupervised scenario, meaning that we don't include any of the instrument labels for training. On the, on the rightmost column, we used 100% of the instrument labels for training. So as you can see in the unsupervised scenario, where we don't have any of the instrument labels, both of the, case has, both of the cases have some ambiguity in, in around, around this area. And then the, uh, the other difference is that um, the Gaussian mixture prior can learn multiple crosses here. Each of the cross represent the mean parameter of one Gaussian component. And then each color here represent one of the 12 instruments. So with only 25% of the instrument labels, actually the GMEA can resolve most of the ambiguity while the VAE still suffer from such ambiguity. So using all the labels for the training, uh, we can almost learn a perfect clustering in Gaussian mixture vari variation autoencoder. So here's the first um, application that we consider in this work, um, which is controllable sound synthesis. In this case, we can discard, after training, we can discard all the encoder, and then we just sample from the prior distribution. So the first, um, so we sample from the pitch space as well as the temper space. In this case, for example, we want to generate a sound sample, which is piano, and which has the pitch A4. Then what we do is simply pick the corresponding Gaussian components in the pitch space, which is the A4, and also the corresponding Gaussian component in the timbre space, which is the piano here. Then we just sample from these two spaces and then use the decoder to render our generated sample. To restore the waveform, we use traditional algorithms such as griffin lin the other application that we can consider is many-to-many -many temper conversion. So um, in this case, we want to convert the sound sample of French horn A4 to the sound sample of piano A4. So the problem of timbre conversion is that we want to change the timbre without affecting the pitch. So we first input a French horn of A4 and then we, in, we infer the pitch latent variable ZP. And then we don't manipulate or change the pitch variable here. We just, uh, uh, instead we change the uh, timber variable in the timber space. The way we change is by um, travel along the conversion vector from French horn to piano. 
And the conversion vector here is calculated by subtracting the target instrument, which is piano, to the source instrument, which is French horn. So what we do is just to obtain such a conversion vector and then travel along from source to target and then use a alpha as the multiplier to control the traveling amount. So for example, if we get alpha equal to 0 0.5, this can render a um, sound sample that has the intermediate timbre between piano and French horn. Furthermore, this framework, this model is capable of many to many timbre conversion, meaning that we don't, um, we don't need to train different models for different conversion pairs. So after training this model, we can just use this single model to do all possible combination of source and target pair. And here is some demonstration. And later on, I'll open up the demo page and then um, I will be playing um, some, applic um, some applications, some sounds in the order of first controllable sound synthesis. So we can synthesize the piano. Uh, in, uh, we can specify the instrument that we want to uh, synthesize. For example, piano or violin and with different pitches. And also many to many timber com uh, conversion from, in this case, from cello to bassoon and using different amount of conversion. And finally, um, we also discovered that one of the dimension in the timber space corresponds to spectral centroid. So um, we can control that particular dimension and then, and then synthesize the sound samples with different spectral centroid. Right, so now I want to share the other screen. So this is the demo page. Mm. So first, uh, I want to demonstrate the, uh, uh, the upper bound for the audio quality in this work because we are using the traditional algorithm, which is Griffin Lim for recentesis. So this, this is the original audio waveform. And this is the resynthesized audio waveform. That is to convert the audio waveform to the male spectrogram and then convert it back directly using Griffin Link. And this is piano. So this gives you a perspective of the upper bound of the audio quality in this work. Cello, bassoon. Okay, let me see if anyone has some problem. Okay, so I think people don't have problem regarding the demo page and sounds. Okay, it's great. So first of all, let us see the uh, listen to the controllable sound synthesis. So now we have the English horn, and then we synthesize the different pitches. French horn, trumpet, percussion. Show. Yeah, so clarinet. So that's the controllable sound synthesis, and these are the spectral and corresponding spectrograms. And then the uh, many to many timbre transfer. Um, so in this case, we want to convert the timbre of French horn to piano without changing the pitch. So again, this is the source uh, French horn. This is our target. This is the intermediate sound. And same for piano to cello. Let's play this first. And interestingly, um, like G6 is not a practical register for 
uh, the cello uh, for the cello to play. But in this case, the model um, somehow managed to generalize mm, this kind of high register for, for the cello. So we convert the piano with G6 to the cello with G6. And yes, okay, let's do, let's listen to some bassoon to French horn. Yeah, so that's the timber conversion. And finally, the disentangling the spectral centroid, and this um, probably refers to the dynamic of the sound because that is, I think, the third most, uh, the third significant attribute in this data set. One is the pitch, the other is the instrument, and finally is the, 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 the dynamic. So, so the models somehow capture this attribute in the latent space as well. So for example, the piano. So in this case, we change that particular dimension of the timbre space, and then we can listen to the generated sound. Violin. So they sort of preserve the pitch and the instrument timbre, but vary in terms of the preserve the instrument identity, but varies in terms of the timbre, uh, specifically the dynamic. Right, so this is the corresponding spectral rim here. Right, so that is the first part of the um, demonstration. And I could just switch back to this, right. Uh, okay, I believe now I'm switching back to the um, slice. Let me see. Okay. Wait. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure that I'm sharing correctly. Right. So next one is the modeling expressive singing voices using the same exactly same framework. Um. So as before, we use the same framework. And then there's, there are also two, hmm? I heard a sound effect. Is there any problem here? Okay, no, right. So we have a exactly same framework to model the expressive singing voices. Um, so two attributes, in this case, it is the singer ID and the vocal technique. So the generative process simply says that to determine a expressive singing voice, we first determine which singer we want to sing with, and then um, which technique is the, is the singer going to use. Um, so, so in this case, we assume both the attributes are given. In this case, both our attributes are supervised. So the singer ID, um, the labels are given, and the vocal technique, uh, the label for vocal technique are also given. And for the data set, we use a subset of vocal set. And in this data set, we have six different um, vocal techniques, vibrato, straight, breathy, belt, vocal fry, and lip trill. Perhaps the most expressive um, vocal technique are the vocal fry and lip trill in this case. So um, we have 20 singers in this data set and six vocal techniques. And then we have scale and, and, and all the contexts are sung in scale or arpeggios in, diff, in five volts. And each clip can range from 3.5 seconds to 23 seconds. And we use more than 1,000 recordings and which is around 2.84 hours. This is the architecture and the training objective. From a higher perspective, higher level perspective, actually this is exactly the same as the previous one. We have the data input and we have, the, we have two encoders, one for the singers and the other for the timbre. 
uh, the other for the vocal technique, sorry. So, and then we have, over, uh, we also have a shared decoder here to reconstruct our data. Uh, which, uh, the, the significant, one of the significant difference from the previous one is that we use the um, by LSTN in this case, because our input is now longer, uh, it's now di first divided into multiple chunks. And for each of the chunks, we, um, we have a segment or chunk level latent representation. ZS and superscript, superscript by N. And the by LSTM is to model the temporal relationship between this um, um, segment level representations. And then we also have a classifier to in, improve the discriminability of the sequence level feature. The sequence level feature here is derived by aggregating the sequence level, um, uh, segment level representation. And the aggregation is either by attention mechanism or a simple um, average functionality. So what we are doing is simply um, aggregate the segment level representation to a sequence level representation. And we use attention mechanism here. So for the objective function, what we are doing is same as before. We have the decoder for reconstruction and we have technique encoder um, to regularize the technique latent variable to the corresponding um, Gaussian components in the latent space. And now we have a weight that weight differently for um, across, across the segments. Because the intuition here is that not all the segment level representation contribute equally to the technique that is labeled for this whole sequence. So for example, maybe like the singers is in instructed to sing vibrato in this case, but, but it turns out that the singer can, can only do a good job in the very beginning of the recording. So, the mechanism here, the way, the, the waste here is to, is to reflect the kind of, the kind of, um, the kind of um, uh, phenomenon that, that the singer can only perform um, appropriately in some of the, um, in some of the time, in some of the time steps in the, the in the sequence. So, Finally, we use a classifier to, to improve the discriminability uh, you, given the sequence level um, feature as the input and to classify the corresponding um, annotations. So here is all, uh, just a um, simple attention mechanism. And this is how we aggregate the segment level latent representation to sequence level latent representation. So here's the Tisney projection of the singer and technique latent variable. And specifically, we visualize the output of the singer latent variable, uh, singer encoder, and the technique encoder. On the, on the left column, um, it is the output of the singer encoder. On the right column, it is the output of the technique encoder. In the first row, we color the latent variable by singers. And we can see that when we do so, there is no clear cluster in the technique space, whereas we have such clusters in the singer, um, in the singer space. Whereas when we color by the techniques, we can observe the clear cluster in the vocal technique space, whereas we don't have such a cluster in singer space. And such visualization qualitative, qualitatively shows that um, we disentangle the two attributes into two different spaces. And these are the conversion of both attributes. This shows some sound sample later. So this is a single model that can achieve um, at the same time, both singer and technique conversion. More specifically, we have in the upper row, um, we convert the singer. So for example, we can convert the male singer number three as the source data, as the source singer, to different, um, to different 
to other singers. So we can do cross singer conversion. We can also do within uh, cross gender conversion. We can also do within gender conversion. And this similarly applies to the female singer as the source. And at the same time, we can use the exact, we can use the same model, the same single model, the train one, to convert the vocal technique uh, uh, to, 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 to achieve many to many conversion for the vocal techniques. So for example, we have the lip trill as the source and we can convert to different other techniques. Notice that when we use the lip trill as the source data, actually it is corresponding to the task of denoising, audio denoising. So as you can see, um, the lip trio is kind of noisy. And if we want to convert to the plain singing, which is the straight without any decoration, and it is actually similar to the task of denoising. So, which, is, which can be very challenging as you can. Similarly, um, if we have the vocal fry as the source, uh, um, converting it to other, any other vocal technique can also be seen as a denoising problem. And then we can, perhaps the more interesting application is that we can convert the plain singing, the straight singing to a more technical one. So decorate the singing with different vocal techniques. Okay, so let's do some here. Um, so similarly, that let me give you some perspective on the upper bound uh, for the audio quality. So, so again, we we do not focus on the audio quality in these two work. Instead, we focus on disentanglement. So we again use the Griffin name as our um, as our audio inversion um, algorithm. So. This is the um, original data, straight and sung by a uh, female number one. And then we directly convert from the audio waveform to the male spectrogram and directly convert it back using Griffin name back to waveform. This is to give you a perspective on the upper bound for the audio quality. <laughs> Yeah, so you can hear the background noise there. And this is actually caused by the um, caused by the Griffin Dim algorithm that I use for this work. And this is the straight. And we have belt. And we have breathy. We have lip trill. And vibrato. And vocal fry. So yeah, so as you can as you can hear the by uh, the vocal fry and the lip trill are the two most expressive singing voice in our data set, perhaps. And one problem of this data set, in my opinion, is that you can hear some vibrato actually in the straight, in the data that labeled as straight. For example, yeah, this one is relatively straight, but. Yeah, actually, you can you can still hear some vibrato in some of the straight data, or or similarly, you can hear um, like some of the label data are actually not that not that representative for for the corresponding labels. But yeah, this is some subjective nature of the label, I guess. So so. Which, which really, like anyway, caused some problem for for the model to 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 really um, learn the um, the the data because we learn from the annotated data. So in the future, we want to build some model that can 
um, they can actually learn without labels because those labels, because labels can be noisy and we don't um, actually want the model to learn from noisy data and label data are not always helpful. So anyway, um, let's demonstrate the vocal technique conversion here. Um, so now we have the lip trio um, convert to any other vocal technique. So for example, this is the source. Convert to belt. So as you can see, the um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you use the picture as the source, actually it corresponds to a task of denoising. So it can be actually challenging. And this is to convert the lip trill to straight. Let's hear the source again. Yeah, so actually you can hear um, the characteristic of the spectrogram. You can, you can see the characteristic of the spectrogram change a lot. And then also perceptively, um, you can hear such a uh, difference. And perhaps more interestingly, we can convert the straight, um, the singing without any decoration to a more expressive one. So the, the source is, is like this. <laughs> can convert to belt. To breathy. To lip trail. To um, vibrato. And yeah, so here is just additional samples that you can enjoy, um, if you will. So um, this kind of summarizes my talk, and the rest of the presentation are about conclusion and future work. Um, so we've presented a um, semi-supervised framework based on Gaussian mixture VAE to achieve disentanglement of the attributes. And we demonstrate its application in controllable attribute synthesis and conversion. The ongoing works include unsupervised disentanglement. So as I mentioned earlier, um, unsupervised is always cool. And we don't always want to rely on labels data, on, lab on label data because label data, as I mentioned earlier, can be noisy in music domain. And uh, we want to use a um, stochastic prior distribution. That, said, that means that the um, data variable ZT uh, at time step T depends actually on mm, the, pre the, the data variable of the previous time steps. So instead of um, regularizing the all time steps using the same static a prior distribution. We want, perhaps want to use a more stochastic and dynamic prior distribution. And this allows for a, a more um, faithful modeling of sequential data. And I think that is important for musical and audio sequence. So um, that's pretty much of it. And I think I can receive your question and try to answer if I can. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, June, for the great talk. Uh, I think I saw some questions appear in the chat. Maybe you can have a look. Okay, I'm looking at it. Mm. Okay. The first one is... Okay, the first one is from Krishna. 
in your network, do the timber and pitch encoders learn mutually independent representations of timber and pitch, or can they have dependencies? Does one point in the obtained latent space correspond to one spectrogram? Yes. So um, in the framework that we just shown, that we just showed um, that um, the, the graphical model uh, modeled independently for timber and pitch. So there is no interaction or there's no edge between the node of timber and pitch. So that means in our model, pitch and timber are modeled independently. Yes. And does one point in the obtained latent space correspond to one spectrogram? Yeah. So we use, uh, the, the, the data input is a spectrogram, a 500 millisecond spectrogram. And um, we use it as an input and encode into the latent space. So each point in the latent space refers to one spectrogram. Uh, the next one, where from Hertz, where only steady state sounds used for a spectrogram input. Um, can you elaborate on that more in detail? Where only steady state sounds used for the spectrogram input. Yeah, oh, okay, I think so, because um, in um, all the data set I include in this task uh, are, are legato, meaning that um, they, are, mm, they are not decorated in any way. So they are not vibrato, they are not pizzicato, something like that. They are just mm, normal um, legato, legato sounds. Mm -hmm. Who says uh, he, mean, he means if you cut off the transients? Oh, right. So no, so 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 I use the the first five hundred millisecond from the start. That means there is transient from onset to sustain. So we in actually include the onset portion of the notes, and we include so because um, there is a study saying that uh, the onset actually offers or provide a more dis distinguishable uh, characteristics for the notes. I mean, in order to dis in order to di distinguish different instruments, onset is a relatively good cue or feature for for that. You mentioned one of the latent dimension, yeah. Oh, so for that particular latent dimension for the spectrocentroid, uh, we didn't do any of the regularization to achieve them. That that is like automatically discovered, and. It makes sense because, um, as I said earlier, dynamic is the other is yet another um, significant attribute in the data set. So instruments, pitch, dynamic, and in this case, we only regularize pitch and timbre in a model. So the 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 last significant attribute somehow just automatically pop up in the latent space. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jun, for answering these questions. Um, it was a very interesting seminar. If uh, I posted two links in the comments, if people are interested to read your papers, you can find them on the webinar page. Um, and if you want to discuss, you can use the Google group as a mailing list and just uh, further discuss as well. We can stay online for another two minutes in case somebody thinks of another question. But I'd just like to say thanks a lot for your presentation. And next week, we'll have Hao Hao Tan, who will be presenting on uh, deep learning models for music generation. So that would be exciting. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for a nice word and attending. Uh, Jun, I think there's another question. Uh, what if instead of assuming a multimodal VAE, you cluster the latent space of a vanilla VAE? Uh, okay, let me check the chat.
Mm. What if, so yeah, assuming multimodal VAE, you cluster the latent space of Molina VAE, would this be equivalent in your opinion? So if you use the Molina VAE, the natural formulation of the VAE is that the, late, the, the prior distribution P of Z is by nature unimodal. So you must use some trick to force some clustering behavior. Like you can add more um, regularization for, for, for enforcing such a cluster, clustering behavior in the latent space. Whereas if you use the Gaussian mixture variation autoencoder, the prior distribution is by definition a Gaussian mixture. So, so, so that would naturally form a cluster if, if trained properly. Um, so yeah, you can, you, you, can, you, you, can definitely, mm, you can definitely force a clustering behavior in your latent space, even if you are using variation autoencoder, Vanita VAE, but you don't have the perk that I just, um, that I just presented, meaning the mean parameters, um, the, the, yeah, the mean parameters of each of the cluster, because you naturally get that if you use Gaussian mixture VAE, but you don't, like there's no intuitive way to, to get such a parameters if you are using the Benita VAEs. So <clears throat> there's no, intuitive way to um, clear, clearly define the, the clusters in, 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 your, in, your, in your latent space. Whereas in the Gaussian mixture VAE, it is clearly defined by the um, individual Gaussian parameters. Yeah, that is a good question by Hertz because so in, in this case, if we don't know about the correct number of Gaussian mixtures, um, one, we can over specify the number of the number of the Gaussian components as in like if you refer to the original um, um, literature that I cite that I cite under the slides. Um, the one, the one by 2007, the one by Zen 2017 um, in, I, in IJK, and that one shows that if you over if you over specify the number of the the, the Gaussian the Gaussian components, you the model will actually automatically um, assign subclusters for some of the classes. So, for example, if you are training on the NIST data set. Some of the digit, for example, uh, maybe nine, you can write nine in different ways. And then maybe there are some writing styles that are, um, <clears throat> that are highly uh, different from, from others, even if you are writing the same digit nine. And in that case, the model, because it is given more than 10 um, components. So in that case, maybe the model will use the uh, additional com uh, components to address that variation in the digit nine. And that is one possibility that is already shown in the paper, in the IJK paper. And the other, the other way to do it is by, go, is by going to full Bayesian approach. That means you can impose another prior distribution on top of the, on top of the categorical, on top of the, um, um, yeah, on top of the categorical variable. And then on top of the numbers of the categorical variable, I mean. So in that case, you can let the model to determine automatically um, which, which number it will converge. And yeah, that is the full Bayesian approach on that, on, uh, to address that problem. And Yes, that is, that is my opinion on that. 